Create Without Sight. Connect, collaborate and create. Hello and welcome to the Sound Without Sight podcast. In this episode, we welcome Slough Hallettin. Slough is a New York-based producer, studio owner, musician and advocate for accessibility within music production tools. He is best known for supporting the development of the accessibility features within Pro Tools and Sibelius. In this interview, Slough covers topics such as his journey as a recording engineer, producer and studio owner, his tips for honing the people skills involved in these roles as a visually impaired person, and his experience of working with Avid to improve accessibility within their products and becoming the voiceover guru for Pro Tools. This interview was recorded live as part of the Sound Without Sight monthly meetup session for February 2024, featuring questions submitted by our community. We hope you enjoy. So Slau, thank you so much for taking the time to join us this evening or this afternoon for you over <laughs> in New York. How are you? Very good. Thank you so much. And uh, it's it's a pleasure to be here to speak with you guys. So we've got a few introductory questions to begin with, just to kind of break the ice and get an idea of your career as a whole, because it's, it's got so many different facets to it. And Zenny was going to ask the the first few questions. So over to you, Zenny. Mm-hmm. Sure. So I'm just going to jump straight into it. Um, so from what we know, so you have a wide ranging career. What's it like working with Grammy nominated artists? And uh, what are some achievements that you're particularly proud of? I see. Uh, well, you know, I started out originally sort of as a as a session musician playing guitar on sort of like film, documentary, soundtracks and stuff. And it was through a friend who also worked at this particular studio in Manhattan. And I I really enjoyed the process and I was fascinated by the technology. That's what got me into it in the first place. And then round about that time, uh, I was in a band. We were preparing to record a demo of a few songs and went into a different studio in Brooklyn, Systems 2 in Brooklyn, and was j- I just fell in love with the process. And the thing was, I didn't consider it a career choice uh, uh, at that time yet. I ended up going to school for something entirely different, a very visually based career in industrial design. So I went to an art college in Brooklyn, Pratt Institute, and I never quite finished because halfway through my school career, I was diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa. So uh, there was really no way for me to complete my work right at that time when I was first diagnosed. I thought, well, you know, this isn't going to affect me, but boy, very quickly it did. And so I never did finish school. I did work a little bit as a, as a sort of an account executive at an industrial design exhibit company in, in Long Island city here in New York. And then at a certain point, I did seek out some help from the New York state commission for the blind, because I realized after visiting the lighthouse in New York City, that I was legally blind. And I had no idea. This was all very new to me. So within a couple of years, I went from, you know, having quote unquote normal sight to not even realizing that I was legally blind. And so uh, the counselor at the CBVH in New York said, listen, you know, you're entitled to like certain benefits to help you finish school because you never finished the first time around. And so I said, sure, okay, well, what, you know, what can be done? What, how can you assist me? And they said, well, with adaptive technology and stuff like that. So I did go back to school, uh, this time to a music school, Five Towns College, and there was a concentration in audio recording technology there. So my career path, uh, as far as I was concerned, was going to be, you know what, I'm going to get into electronic music production and sort of aim to maybe teach that uh, subject or, te- you know, teach that as as a profession. And it just, that just sort of went 
uh, by the sidelines because I just got so involved in the the recording process as opposed to just electronic music production. So anyway, that's what started me off in the recording world. And just like most people, I started off recording myself, my friends and stuff like that. And then before you know it, you're recording friends of friends, and then you're recording strangers, because by word of mouth, you just get these calls. And so I uh, I continued doing that for a number of years until in, in the early 90s, my former wife and I moved to London for a couple of years. And there... All I did was, since I was not in school, I took a, a leave of absence from school, from, from Five Towns College. I was working full time just recording stuff. So I was recording, uh, you know, small projects in London. And then when I got back to New York, as I finished school, I had a lot of these, uh, you know, it wasn't friends calling me anymore. It was literally just people calling me word of mouth from other projects that I had done before I left for England. So just that just took off. I, before you know it, I I'm recording, you know, pretty well-known artists in the New York area, largely jazz. And then it sort of branched off into things like musical theater and cabaret. And you know, the thing is working with, I mean, I, I've gotten to work with, yes, uh, you know, Grammy winning artists, Tony winning artists, Oscar winning artists, even like actors, not necessarily always musicians, but just actors who are doing like voiceover work. So it's really, it's so unpredictable what, you know, what direction your career is going to take. If you, if you get involved in audio, you could be you could be working on one type of project and then before you know it, get into sound design and suddenly you take off in that direction. Uh, I can't say that I ever planned anything. It's just I, I fell into what I do naturally. I, I do a bunch of orchestral recordings. I, I, I've done that for probably 30 years now. That was something that I never could have planned on. Uh, it was just... So, you know, somebody contacted me and asked if I would be willing to do that. And I said, sure. And it involved going to Ukraine to record an orchestra there. So I dove in and never looked back. And I just, I do it you know, regularly every year, every other year we do a project. So I'm sorry. I, there's no such thing as a short answer from me. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fun. I think that was really insightful as well. And actually, you answered the next question, funnily enough. Mm. Um, okay. So, you know, that, and that was kind of like what kind of came first, which you've already kind of answered. Mm -hmm. I yeah. had a couple of follow up questions. Well, kind of just one, actually. Yeah. You mentioned, you know, that you kind of were able to make a lot of network, like connections and a lot of networking was done through like word of mouth. Yes. Um, obviously, a lot of it's kind of moved to social media now. How is that working for you? Has that created any kind of hindrances, or is you know, are you is that better, or like, yeah, how are you finding kind of social well, media and making networking and stuff? Right. Well, you know, the thing is, when uh, and and I have to, I have to preface this by saying, uh, in all honesty. I've been trying to retire. <laughs> I, I really, I enjoy what I do, but for me, I've, for a few years now, I've been trying to retire, trying to take on, uh, to take, uh, not to take on smaller projects and just stay with the bigger ones and the ones that I enjoy working on. So the the idea of sort of like networking and that kind of thing, to me at this point, is not a priority at all. It's not something that I really seek out. You know, when I first, well, 30 years ago, had there been a Twitter and a Facebook back then, I would have been all over it for sure. But there wasn't. and And I enjoyed the sort of the, the camaraderie of uh, my sort of 
audio peeps, you know, for lack of a better term, my audio colleagues, let's say, on Twitter, because we had some great discussions and it was easier to sort of plan on getting together at conventions like the the Audio Engineering Society convention or the NAM show. It really was was quite nice to be able to network in that way. At this point, I'm sort of slowly getting away from that a little bit because like I said, I'm I'm trying not to actively grow my business. I'm perfectly content to just keep it going as it is. And you know, but I but I certainly realize it's it's you know, the importance of social media in terms of people who are getting into the business or thinking of getting into it these days. Yeah, no, that that's fair enough. And like, obviously, you know, you've done so much in your career from what it seems that you're, you know, obviously more than kind of entitled to kind of sit back and just <laughs> you know, chill. And so following on from that, you know, throughout your career, you know, have you had any particularly challenging barriers or obstacles that you had to kind of face? And, you know, what, if there were any, what were the solutions yeah, I th- I think you know as a blind person, I mean, <laughs> there there are innumerable challenges just all the time. <laughs> I mean, we all know, you know, the the challenges that we face in terms of software and hardware and accessibility. I mean, that's always a big challenge. If for me, having been sighted at one time, you know, I was used to being able to 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 get around very easily and sort of access anything I wanted. Since I did lose my vision over at least, you know, I I mentioned that I lost a bunch of vision very quickly, but then it was sort of very a very steady, very slow decline. So at first, I was able to access materials like printed materials, books and such, diagrams, you know, flow charts and that kind of thing. I could I could see that on on a CCTV. You know, these days, of course, I, well, not of course, I should I should say that I, I really have no useful vision. So for me, that's not an option, and it hasn't been for for years. So, I mean, that kind of challenge I I face every day. We all do. Yeah, definitely. You know, in terms of the 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 social kind of thing. I mean, socializing with networking, let's say, with other colleagues and stuff in person. There was a time when I could. M- go myself for example to an AES show or or a NAM show but you know it's been years since I've been able to do that so you know I mean whenever I attend shows like that I I always go with someone I've I've even you know quote unquote hired people <laughs> to meet me at a show and just go with me to various to visit various vendors and booths and stuff like that because anyone who's ever been to some of these conventions uh, the show floors are just so packed with people that you you can barely navigate the floor as a sighted person you know and so yeah i i decided i'm going to make it easier on myself and 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 get some help yeah, and I think, you know what, that's part of it. Like, that's, it's always the little things you have to consider, like, you know, mm-hmm. getting around and stuff like that. Yeah. And you have to, like, you know, you have to do what you've got to do, resort to the, whatever you can. And obviously, like, I think you, you said that, you know, you lost a bunch of vision, then it was kind of gradual. Yeah. Like, it must have been really difficult to kind of keep adapting to all these changes. But, you know, despite mm-hmm. that, you yeah. know, you seem very successful, you know, and you've got, you know, you, you're, running your own studio and stuff mm-hmm. which kind of leads me on to my kind of last question which isn't actually mine it's a community question okay <laughs> so one of our people that's currently listening actually asked this question and it was basically sorry just reading it um so it was about the studio it was basically is running a studio your main like source of income now and also like how did you fund setting it up and also i think as a kind of like little follow-up from my end as well like 
what inspired you to kind of look into kind of owning a studio right uh, so i so it was you know again when I, when i was entering when i went to college the second time around it wasn't my intention to own and operate a studio that i didn't that wasn't my initial plan but i was interested in in recording so i purchased you know like a multi track recorder it was a cassette based you know four track and then i uh, upgraded it to an eight track where i was just recording out of home and then i entered school and then you know that's when that that whole thing really shifted for me where i realized oh my gosh you know this is what i love to do you know and so maybe there's some way that i could make this a, a sort of a full-time job because i enjoyed it i was apparently good at it <laughs> people sought me out granted these were friends and friends of friends but everybody just loved what i was doing for them and when the time came i mean i was working out of home at this time and so my my first wife like i said before we moved to england I, I was i was just recording out of home she was very supportive and uh, you know if i told her listen i'm recording a group of musicians so just like you can't hang around <laughs> go somewhere for the day and i would just work out of you know we had a bedroom that was sort of like a control room and i would set them up uh, set the musicians up in the living room and that's how i started then we moved to london like i said and then there it was a similar situation but when i got back from uh london a space in our building opened up uh and was was empty and so the building that i'm in it, it was purchased by my parents back in 1959 okay and it's really mostly uh, 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 entirely i would say thanks to that fact that i'm able to have a space to work in and make it uh, feasible uh, in terms of you know financially because my overhead is so low a lot of people of course these days they 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 will set up a a, a studio in a in a garage or something like that or in a, a spare bedroom but those studios quote unquote studios that they're really just rooms they're they're essentially a a control room where they can work on mixing maybe they could record something in that room depending on the source whereas here since i have a, a bigger space about a thousand square feet i do have a separate live room a separate control room a separate machine room an iso booth so that the fact that uh, we own the building here makes it possible for me to do this because if i were had i been in a position where i had to seek out a commercial space i just there there would have been times where i just wouldn't have been able to support that in terms of you know if business got a little bit slower you know I, i'd still have to make those payments and i and that would have been in my opinion imp impossible you know so with such a low overhead i've been able to to run non-stop you know from let's say 95 so 25 years or something like that and it is my only source of income is, is the studio but again i have to i have to make it clear that i am married my wife was employed she's now she took an early retirement but i never had to worry about you know paying bills or you know making sure that there was enough money to go shopping for for groceries or whatever because my wife was always employed and took care of that so any money that i got from the studio mostly just went right back into the business so i was fortunate to be able to do that
hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, it definitely does. And it's interesting because there's so many different perspectives and insight, like, you know, particularly with, with studio and stuff like that. Mm. But yeah, I think Jay has some more questions for you now. Yeah, sure geared towards equipment and stuff but yeah sure. thank you for answering my questions thank you and the community questions but yeah sure cool so yeah if we dig into the equipment and the studio a little bit more yeah. now i know we've had sure. quite a lot of questions about this so yeah yeah we, we'll get as many answered as we can so the first one is around i guess that process of building a studio and i guess choosing which gear to go in it researching gear do you specifically look out for things that have been designed with accessibility in mind or do you kind of go for the mainstream stuff that everyone's using and then just try and find ways to make that work for you oh, well mostly uh, when when it, it's changed over the years because when i first got into like when i first moved into this space for example it was an analog you know studio i mean i had a you know a a, a, a large format console i had a a tape machine you know a, a a 16 track you know large thing the size of a washing machine kind of thing and none of that equipment was i mean there there the, the, there was nothing with accessibility design in mind for those things i mean those were those were hardware pieces of equipment that just you know you had your faders you had your buttons i had to memorize the layout of of things as far as the tape machine you know the remote you know you just had to learn the layout of that remote to arm tracks and stuff like that when it came to vu meters at the time if i if i really put put my nose up against the view meter i could pretty much make out where where it was but i i really i i couldn't work that way so i didn't rely on view meters except for if i was recording something like drums something with something where i was pushing the tape a little bit to get some saturation. I, I, I could, it, it used to be behind me where I'm sitting now. I used to turn around and just see if I could just to make out the red peak lights on the view meters, because those were like flashes. And I could, I could tell if I was, you know, if a snare was hitting a track just right, I would, I would see that little peak only on the highest, you know, uh, transients. And so at that time, I, I just had to memorize stuff and, you know, there, there weren't any real issues. Then, of course, as, as things progressed, the tape machine got really old. It, it practically caught fire one time. There was smoke coming out of it, luckily. I smelled it before my client saw the smoke. <laughs> and it, I just realized that, yeah, it was getting more and more expensive to keep a machine like that maintained and so i decided to go for you know changing over to a digital format and i practically went with a what's called a a, a radar system it was at that time it was owned by a company called otari and that was the manufacturer of my tape machine in fact and i was supposed to have a demo model come to me and at the last minute, they said, oh, you know, one of our clients, you know, his machine went down, so we have to send this unit to him. So, you know, it'll be another month or something. And right around that time, Pro Tools HD was introduced. And I had used Pro Tools a little bit in school. I used it with just a screen magnification, you know, program. It was on the Mac. It was called Enlarge. So I could reverse the, the the polarity of the, you know, instead of black on white, it would be white on black. It was easier for me to see. So I was sort of familiar with it a bit. And then I decided it was time to take another look at it. And so I had a license for, for Pro Tools because I had bought, it was a Mark of the Unicorn interface card, which came with Pro Tools. At that time, it was, you know, I don't know, it was Pro Tools five or something like that and i took a look at it and, and it seemed pretty accessible but at this time i was starting to rely on a screen reader rather than just the enlarge 
So I was using Outspoken. And boy, the stuff really looked quite accessible to me. And so I decided to, instead of going the radar route, I decided to go and dive into, into Pro Tools. And it was probably the best thing I could have done you know, at the time. And I have no regrets. I mean, to, to me, I'm very comfortable in the Pro Tools environment and stuff. So since that time, so since, you know, we're talking, I, I made the transition in 1999 to, to being a digital studio. Since then, of course, I had to keep accessibility sort of more so in mind, especially when it came to software, not so much hardware. But, you know, these days when something is hardware based and it has some degree of attention paid in terms of accessibility i tend to you know really support that and 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 try to seek that out for example you know years ago native instruments introduced you know some accessibility you know into their product into their complete control product and since then they've expanded that at the time when they first introduced it it was it was great that they did actually get into supporting accessibility <clears throat> it left a lot to be desired at first but it's improved and i mean even now there's there are things that i wish that it, that it was better at but that's okay things are moving forward and progressing and I think it's a great thing that 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 they've embraced that, and I wish some other companies would would also. Absolutely, I think there is quite a lot of momentum around accessibility right now. Certainly, in the last sure. couple of years, in the time that I've become a lot more involved in this space, yeah. like yeah, it, it's grown so much, and there's so many more people talking about it now, which is great. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, including of course Avid, who who sure. were one of the kind of first people to really kind of make a make a massive step, and mm -hmm. obviously you being kind of part of that and, and helping to drive that. Yes. Just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your experience of working with Avid to improve accessibility across their products. You know, how did that come about and, and are you still involved? Right. Well, uh, as I mentioned, you know, back in the OS 9 days of, of the Macintosh, Pro Tools 5, Pro Tools was quite accessible. It wasn't ideal, but it was really quite accessible. And then when Apple introduced OS uh, I upgraded to OS 10 and then I tried to run Pro Tools under OS 10 and like nothing, of course, was accessible. Outspoken did not work under OS 10. So we had like really no, no options. We had to, a, a lot of the people who were blind Pro Tools users had to stick to OS 9. Then Apple introduced what was originally called Spoken Interface, which became VoiceOver. I was on the beta team for Spoken Interface, and that's when I tried Pro Tools on OS X, and like there was nothing. Like it, it, you, you launched it, and you saw the menu bar, and that was it. So we r reached out to Digidesign at the time. It would be uh, Avid purchased Digidesign as a company. The, Avid was a video company that purchased a, an audio company to sort of ensure uh, that it had a, a, a strong and robust audio platform. Mm -hmm. um, but Digidesign didn't respond to 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 our requests, and we 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 made a petition to ask them to please support the you know the 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 need for accessibility in their products. And we, we got something like 1,500 signatures or something like that. Well, I, I was invited to come out to California to visit with them and discuss th this and sort of like uh, I, I was there to demonstrate really the level of accessibility that we had under OS 9 and then under OS 10. So we had two computers set up. I had my laptop running Pro Tools 5 and, and OS 9, and I showed the, the, the VP of marketing at that time, David Gibbons, and the, the head of Pro Tools, Wendy About. I showed them how I could navigate and do stuff on, on OS 9 with Pro Tools. And then we, right next to it, OS 10, and I just showed them that nothing. I mean, it was like, they, I could see nothing. I could do nothing. And it was a real eye-opener for them. And they said, 
wow, well, we've uh, we obviously have to fix this because you were able to use this under OS 9 and now under OS 10, nothing. So that started a process. Sorry, long story short, they were in the middle of transitioning with like certain the way that widgets were drawn to screen and stuff like that. They said, we need to make this transition first and then we'll address accessibility. So it did take about two two yeah two years i'd say about two years but then they they reached out again and i flew out there and they showed me what what they had done and it was like it was literally like someone turned the light on where you could not see anything now suddenly all these controls were visible and stuff like that so in very in a short amount of time, they had done this and then released it, you know, as part of their, as, as part of the next release, all these accessibility fixes. And then what happened was uh, maybe a, 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 two years later or so, things started breaking down a bit because, you know, the programmers weren't officially paying attention to any of the stuff that was done. And so things were starting to break. And it was right around that time that it was Rich Rich Holmes was the head of Pro Tools at that time. He said, look, we have to sort of like codify this with the CEO, basically, to make this kind of official that we support accessibility. And he had a great idea. And that was to say, you know, voiceover and accessing Pro Tools through voiceover was really no different than accessing it in a different language. And right at that time, Avid was making uh, a concerted effort to support internet. It was there. They called it IL support, international language support. So they were do making Pro Tools in Spanish and Italian and French and, you know, Japanese, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, it's really no different. You're, you're just using a different language, a different way of accessing it. So maybe if you wrote a letter and I wrote a letter to the CEO, we could sort of make this official and make this part of the process. And so I wrote a letter and so did he. And the CEO at the time, Gary Greenfield, said, you you know, Slough, you're working with the right people. Let let them proceed what they're doing and and, you know, let's make it official. So that started the journey that that has continued really to this day. You know, there was at that meeting, I met a person who was the liaison for third party developers, and uh, his name was Ed Gray. And when he walked into the meeting, he he came in and said, ta-da, and I didn't know what was going on. I kind of looked toward the door and there was this guy with a long white cane. I thought, who is this? And then I was introduced to him. And, you know, he said that he, because of diabetes, had started to lose his vision. And so he very quickly, you know, became involved in anything having to do with accessibility, given his obvious connection as a visually impaired person. And you know, we just from there on in, it was like anything that 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 came up in terms of not only accessibility, but just general sort of uh, networking in the industry. I always turned to Ed because he, as the third party, you know, partnering director, he knew everybody and everybody knew him. So mm -hmm. he was a really great connection to have unfortunately you know some people know that that we we lost him recently you know from complications from diabetes and some other stuff so right now we're in the process of you know trying to establish who will take on that that role of sort of uh addressing accessibility sort of like on a, on an ongoing basis we have a whole beta team of course but that's just one aspect you know you need to have somebody who's in the culture of that company to sort of carry that banner because there are plenty of people outside the company who will wave the accessibility flag but you really Absolutely. need somebody inside the company and the good thing though is that over the years various individuals that that we've worked with in in avid you know they're keenly aware of of the issue and have you know helped along the way but again still there needs to be a point person for that so we're just still kind of trying to figure out who that person is
Yeah, I mean, Ed, absolutely massive loss, really, really influential in, in this yeah. space. And it would be great for that initiative to be more kind of tied up across the industry as well. Different companies collaborating on, on yes. the topic of accessibility. Yeah. So there needs to be that kind of that sea change so that, you know, when improvements are made, it's easy to kind of translate that to other software and, you know, sure. document that, that best practice. So just one little quick question. Have you got one piece of advice for someone, maybe they're a, a user of, of technology and they find it frustrating that they're hitting accessibility barriers and they want to make a change. One piece of advice for kind of getting that voice heard? For getting the voice heard? Well, I mean, I think number one, you know, you, you it's, it's always a good idea to seek out other people who are who are in that same boat you know we we now have a bunch of communities uh, there there always were sort of like email lists and and those were great too uh but nowadays not only through just regular social media traditional social media but but also things like the whatsapp groups there are so many these days where you, you know you'll have a community of users that are who have a, a common focused interest like let's say for example there's a complete control whatsapp group there's a pro tools whatsapp group there's a you know all, all you know reaper logic there are so many i think sort of you know being part of those communities i think is important i because i think what happens is that you have situations where s there's bound to be some contact through through individuals in that group there's bound to be some kind of networking contact where so somebody says oh you know what i know so and so from blah 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 and then you know you have the potential to interface with people at various companies and even invite them to participate in real-time chats zoom calls you know we've had that happen with a bunch of people for example byron harden who has ic music you know he's invited you know people from various companies that deal with access that have taken an interest in accessibility and they participate and get to sort of have, you know, Q and A's with people, with users. We've, you know, years ago, we started doing this. We started having a group of people who were uh, blind or visually impaired meet up at NAM, and we would, we would break into like maybe two or three groups of two or three. And we'd go to various developer booths and sort of, speak to these developers and and product owners product managers in person to raise the issue of accessibility and just as as an illustration i mean uh, we we used to go to native instruments every year probably five years in a row and they just never budged i mean they were just not gonna do anything for accessibility it was practically comical how they would say nope we're not doing it i mean it was that blatant you know and and you know I, I i don't know exactly what changed i think possibly the the leadership changed at a certain point but boy when when they got on board it was like you know again like somebody turned the light on and you know and, and i i just to just to be clear you know some companies it, it's not that it's not like they're um, I mean, in the native instruments thing, I'm saying comically, it was almost like they refused to, but they they showed they showed no interest. But there are other companies that it's not that they have no interest; they'd like to make their stuff accessible, but you know they they don't know where to start or they don't know what it's going to take. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a matter of you know just having a connection with a blind and vi visually impaired community to have you know to have some feedback to 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 understand like all right so oh okay labeling buttons and stuff like that that's like the very first basic step like okay so let's start from there you know they they just need a little bit of encouragement i always yeah. point out a, a a a great what i consider a great success story was pace anti piracy when i started using pro tools i discovered this new thing that to me what what is this iLock thing and it was the licensing scheme that 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 
that DigiDesign used at the time. And okay, so it was this key that got inserted in USB slot. You had a little card that, that had the license and you put the card into the key and it would transfer the license from the card, you know. And I thought it was a great system. And at a certain point, they 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 got a sort of like a web interface that that you know came up where you could you could transfer licenses and manage them. But then suddenly they they created a a standalone application, the iLock license manager, and it was not accessible. Like nothing, we could do nothing with it. And so we approached the company, and uh, they said, "Oh, okay, yeah, okay. So you know, we're we're gonna have to work on it, but you know, we have to do a few other things, whatever." So you know, we were, the community was patient because there was still a way that we could sort of get around it. Uh, well, with sighted assistance, of course, that was always an option. But it got to a point where it was like really taking a long time, and 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 one of our Pro Tools users even like threatened a, a lawsuit. I mean, I, it was it was crazy. And I said, I kept telling our users of saying like, you got to be patient. Don't antagonize people. That's the last thing you want to do. You, you got to maintain good relationships with with companies like this. You can't lash out. Fortunately, the way this timing worked out, Pace was switching over from one, the, the platform was QT. That was their authoring platform. They were switching from QT5, I think, to QT6, where accessibility is like pretty much built into QT6, where if you create a program, you can easily make it accessible. But of course, this was legacy code that had to be, you know, it had to be worked on for a little while. And I I later uh, you know heard from from the uh, uh, guys at the company uh, Alan Kronz and Andrew Kirk what the process was like it, it wasn't it wasn't easy for them I mean they had to kind of scratch their heads and go through this 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 process but at the end of it the, the people that worked on it you know presented to like a company meeting what they had done and and like where they were and where they ended up and at the end of this presentation they, they like got a standing ovation it was like a, a, it was almost a team building project you know and it was yeah, fantastic absolutely. it was like I, I thought that it was wonderful that they went from being completely unaware about accessibility to making their their software completely accessible, I I, I would I, I can't even think of an aspect of their uh, their their iLock license manager that isn't yeah, accessible. Yeah. There's there's like maybe one or two list views or something like that 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 don't read exactly correctly, but with OCR, you know, you could you could get an idea of what's going on. But it's like ninety nine percent accessible, and I I think it's a great success story. Yeah, and, it's uh, and those I think kind of that stories. you know it's easier to to see such success stories with smaller companies mm. just because you know it, it's easier to change or or adjust course you know in, in a in a small boat as opposed to a steam liner you know yeah yeah um, no, i do totally get that and i think one yeah. of the things at the moment is trying to kind of document those successes to make it easier for maybe maybe it's big developers maybe it's small developers just to have a breadcrumb trail to pick up you know when they're thinking about you know what do we need to do you know because accessibility can be a, an overwhelming topic if it's not something that yeah. you're used to and it's not in your company culture so yeah just to well one little shout out to the media association on the work that they're doing at the moment trying to pull together a standard or at least a working group for accessibility and also just to flag our knowledge hub at sam without sight as a place a directory to kind of collate all of those communities that you were talking about you know right. if you are if you're really into a specific piece of software it's likely that there are a group of people already using that if it's something that we don't have already on our knowledge hub please do submit an article so that everyone can then access that yeah that's just something that we're trying to do mm -hmm. So just to rattle through a couple of quick questions. So a community question from Scott Chesworth. Is the door comparison project that you produced still a good representation of accessibility in Pro Tools? And if not, what's new? 
Uh, as far as Pro Tools is concerned, not much has changed, really. I mean, they, they've introduced a couple of new features, which are essentially accessible. I would say that the things that they that they recently introduced that that are not really accessible that still need work are like this, like the the, the their their mobile apps, like the the I can't remember what it's called, even like the you know, it's like you can run it on a on a mm -hmm. on an iPad. You know, it's kind of like a, a control, yeah, it's a Sketch or something. I, I oh, can't yeah. remember. Yeah, those things are still not not really usable. There are some controls that are visible and stuff like that, but uh, to me, it's not not viable. I don't know about someone who is visually impaired. Maybe they could use it, and we have some some users that are like Pro Tools users specifically that are visually impaired as opposed to full totally blind. But I haven't heard of any any real success on that front right now but as far as that daw comparison i mean i as far as the pro tools part of it is it's pretty much the same i would say okay so a quick another quick community question from ibrahim on a fake so a quick fire top three which plugin packages or companies would you say are most compatible with voiceover as far as plugins, I mean, most plugin packages are compatible. I would say once in a while you come across these uh, situations where VoiceOver will see plugin parameters, but you can't interact with them to change them. Uh, one good example was at a certain point, Valhalla plugins, you you could see all the parameters, but you could not interact and change them with voiceover. If you had a control surface, you could, and that was fine. And that's when I first got into some of their plugins. I was just using it with a control surface. But since then, I, I, I've reached out to them and I, I'm a friend of a friend is is very close with the developer of of uh, well the, yeah the owner of the company Sean Costello so I was in touch with him and sort of ra raised this issue and like the the following versions of all of their plugins so uh, you could change the parameters with, with voiceover I would say that I'm a big fan myself of the plugin alliance plugins like all of their uh, plugins that uh, well i say all mm, there are a couple of plugins that are sort of more like drum replacement things where you know you have to it, it's more involved in terms of uh, getting involved in the browser of that plugin to choose samples and stuff like that that stuff is not accessible with the plugin align stuff but that constitutes maybe you know three uh, percent of their plugins but all of the rest of their plugins amp modelers you know you know effects like i mean you have eqs and reverbs and all that kind of stuff those are those are all accessible and i they're fantastic and you know sound toys is also another popular one very usable with with voiceover Amazing. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So I think now just to move on to the role of being a producer running sessions. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot, there is a lot of focus within the VI community on overcoming barriers with hardware and software. I was wondering if you had any advice on honing the kind of people sk skills involved in being a producer and a recording engineer. So yeah. I imagine these are kind of all important for coaxing those good performances out of musicians, but we kind of rarely right. hear them speak spoken about. Right. Well, I, I think that's because, you know, these days th there is a lot of focus on, you know, on technique of, you know, how do you, you know, get a great tom sound or a kick sound, you know, whatever. I mean, these are, these are, you know, th there's no shortage of sources for, you know, I mean, of, of people showing you how to do something, whatever. But really that, that's, that is not, at all that's 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 a rather than a 20,000 foot level you know view that's a 20 foot view of the process and you know of making let's i'm i'm going to say r music recording all right in this case that's largely what what you know audio engineers deal with uh, not always but it's often what they deal with music recording it used to be that you would get a job you know mopping a floor you know sweeping a floor cleaning toilets and you graduated to being able to make uh, you know make tea for for the talent you know in a in, in a recording session then you'd move on to us you know maybe being a tape operator 
you work your way up to 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 assistant engineer maybe and if you were lucky one day the engineer didn't show up and you got to sit in in the in the engineer's chair and and do some overdubs or something like that along the way i mean from day 1 you would start getting an education about how to deal with people what to do what not to do equally as important and we just don't see that anymore i didn't have that experience of of getting into the studios uh with with that sort of trajectory mine was going through school so i was taught in school you know what to do what not to do still that that was still theoretical i mean we did have sessions in school and we had to fulfill like all of the various roles you know on various sessions so on on some sessions i did one thing or another session i did another thing and we were you know tested critiqued etc cetera, etc cetera. so you know i think that today I mean, yes, there are schools, of course, that that teach audio. Not too many of them are 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 going to be viable for a blind person to attend, just because some of that stuff is just not going to be accessible. I mean, when I say some of that stuff, you know, they they might have uh, you know a large format console and a tape machine, and if and if you have no sight. It's it's going to be a challenge. So so it's not the easiest thing to to get into in terms of you know being a blind person. I I think that you know the what what can one say? Having said that, I mean you you kind of almost have to you know get, dive in at the deep end and learn by your mistakes. <laughs> I mean if if you do know other you know individuals not necessarily blind or visually impaired individuals but but anybody else and try to sort of pick their brain about uh, what you know what kind what what are good practices and you know what would be common scenarios i think that's a that's a good idea i mean this this subject yeah you you, you don't hear it uh, even in the sighted community you know people don't talk about you know in terms of production about getting a good performance one once in a while you'll see an article about it or something like that but i think part of why we don't see this discussed too much is because there's an infinite variety of individuals personalities and circumstances that you could almost never uh, say anything about it that's going to apply to a different situation you know you, you you're you're dealing in an environment that's potentially you know emotions can run high and you know it could be volatile in that sense i think largely it's common sense you know you 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 try to think twice before you say something and it's again it depends on your role in the studio as well because if you're just assisting someone you you shouldn't uh, offer your two cents mm -hmm. uh you know because it's it's not your place in terms of the in terms of you know how things would work in 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 a in a situation i mean i ha i had a situation once where i had an assistant who during a session you know it really st st struck up a conversation you know and started offering advice to one of the musicians and i thought oh gosh i can't believe <laughs> they start you know and i of course had to tell them later on you, that is not appropriate you don't do that you're you're not part of the production team you haven't been here for previous sessions and stuff like that it, you know you you have to learn you know how to interact but it's it's largely experience and sometimes it, it's it's an uncomfortable process learning that you know but that's yeah that's one of the ways that you do learn sure sure so just moving on we've got another community question from peter bosher which is saying given the differences in ways of working there might be between sighted and and blind or or visually impaired producers how do you approach collaborating with a team so other producers or engineers or musicians who might be 
sighted or blind like what do you feel like the differences are there in like and what how can you kind of build bridges between those two communities in a session yeah i mean <clears throat> as far as working with other with with sighted i mean 99 percent of the people i work with are sighted so i i just you know if i if i meet someone or somebody's coming in for a session i mean i'm talking talent in this case mostly or even if they're a, a producer or another engineer or something like that i mean the very first thing i will i will tell them even even in a in an email before they get here is oh by the way i'm blind just so you know and if i if that just didn't, if the opportunity didn't present itself or it slipped my mind, I tell them immediately when when they come in, just so that because I in in the studio I I don't walk around with a cane or anything like that, and and many people have just assumed that I was sighted, so I I make it a point uh, these days to to make sure I tell them when I do work with someone who is blind. I mean, there is a certain kind of shorthand I think that 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 we all kind of understand that you know like if if you know if if that a blind person comes into the studio i mean i i let them know by the way to your right there's a thing you know there's a whatever a mic stand or a table or whatever it is to to avoid the sort of you know unfortunate incidents where they you know they walk into something or knock something over so it, obviously i'm prepared for that kind of eventuality or i shouldn't say eventuality possibility because people don't always walk into things <laughs> but you know it's i don't think i do anything differently with sighted individuals i i just think that that it's it to, to me it's a non issue and and usually to them it's a non issue i mean once in a while they might they might point out something or 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 do something that is clearly visual and i yeah i will remind them i have no idea what you're pointing at and they go oh sorry you know they like that they'll it just reminds them of something you know like that but but you know, I I don't think I do anything different with sighted uh, talent or engineers or anything like that. But cool. with with blind people, yeah, sometimes I, I I just try to think what would I like to know if I were them, and I try to accommodate. And I guess what what about if you're you're working with musicians who are used to working in a really kind of specific way, you know, with communication through the glass from the engineer, and, and that can be quite a kind of visual form of communication. Right. Have you so, developed any ways of working there that might be useful yeah, for others? Yeah. So, so there, there's, there's, there's no difference whatsoever for me. I have always been in a situation where the talent is in the other room. I'm in the control room. I always hear them from the microphone. They always hear me through the talkback in their headphones. And also, I have speakers in the live room. So even if they're not, if they don't happen to be wearing headphones at the time. If I press the talkback button, it goes over the, the 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 loudspeakers in the in the live room. So, the communication in terms of that is is never has never been different for me. I do have windows in the control room. I I didn't when I started, and to me it was a non-issue. But then I then I realized as I was working with other producers, I realized that the visual sort of connection between live room and control room was more important when say the producer you know wanted to make a motion like keep going and you know turn their hands in a circle something like that so i put in windows years ago it doesn't make any difference for me although probably for the talent sometimes I will, you know, for, I'm sitting here at the, at the at the at the mixing mm -hmm. console, right? So the windows are in front of me where the live room is over there and I know where people are set up. So if I gesture to someone to cue them because they weren't sure about where to enter, they get the benefit of me cueing them. Mm -hmm. What I don't get the benefit of with the windows is like let's say we're listening back to something and very you know let's say i'm sure it's the same with with various uh, daws you know you have the, the the capability of monitoring playback or live input and with with pro tools on on any given track you're either monitoring the 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 playback or input you can't do both at once if from the session itself 
So I have a specific, uh, you know, setup so that I can monitor the the live room no matter what's going on. I, I have a microphone in there that where I can hear. So if if we're listening back to a vocal take, you know, I mean, sometimes the talent will go like, you know, they'll wave and they'll shake, they'll shake their head, you know. So it's clear to a sighted engineer that, oh, no, they want to redo that. But I monitor the live room and, and the talent just knows they'll go, eh, no, you know, I could hear them already say like, I didn't like that, you know. So, you know, for, for me, I, I like the fact that they're comfortable with the visual aspect of working just like they do in any other studio to me, you know, again, the the playback and stuff like that is is sort of setting it up so that I can monitor in real time what their reactions are. That that's a little accommodation for me. And the other thing that I've that I've done is I use a plugin called Mutomatic from Sound Radix, which is a just a way of automatically having my talk back be heard to to the talent in their headphones. I don't even have to press talk back. So if the transport is stopped, they hear me. I don't have to worry about reaching over and oh, where's the talk back button. Oh, there it is. You know, I I, I hit mm -hmm. it or something. I, I don't even have to do that. I just it's just automatic. Once the transport starts, once it's engaged and we're playing, it mutes automatically. So th they don't hear the control room anymore. As soon as I stop, they can hear me, and I could still hear them, of course, because of the microphones. That's cool. I've not, I've not heard of that plugin. That's, that's a really yeah, good Yeah, it's one. a free plugin from SoundRadix, S-O-U-N-D-R-A-D-I-X, soundradix.com. Cool. So just one more question on this topic of, of running sessions. How yeah. do you approach kind of keeping notes during a session? And, you know, I, I guess I'm used to working with producers and they're scribbling away on a piece of paper or yeah. marking up a score, that kind of thing. Any mm -hmm. tips for kind of keeping hold of all the good information, you know, what was a good part in a take and, and that kind of thing? Yeah, what what I tend to do is uh, I have in Dropbox, I have a, a folder with, with all of my uh, current uh, clients and I keep a record of every session. And if there, if something does come up, I just, I hit command tab and I just type, you know, my notes that way. But I don't do that so often. Usually, okay, when I'm working with a, 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 another producer, that's their job. They take their notes. I might jot down things like, oh, you know, I think, you know, this the take three, like playlist three in this particular song, you know, somebody might have bumped a mic. I got to check that or something like that. You know, I, I might write a note like that for myself. But when I've, when I do, more complicated, more complex sessions. I mean, like, for example, the, the orchestral sessions that we do, I just, I record the whole thing. I mean, I, you know, because we'll have typically three hour long blocks of sessions. So we might do two or three, three hour sessions in a day at the studio. And we might do that two or three days in a row. I will literally have like a an R O nine, you know, what do you call it? The, not Roland. What's the, the the forgot the company name? Ederol, Ederol, owned by Roland. Ederol R zero nine, mm -hmm. and I would just record the whole thing in real time, so that if and if if I ever have to refer to something. I know I have it there and I'll say out loud, you know, the, I'll keep the thing right there on the desk next to me and I'll say out loud, oh, I, you know, I got to check this take or whatever, you know, for, for this particular mic or this particular section. And I just, I, I, it's like a, it's like, a, yes, it is more to go through in terms of audio, but I only refer to it if I need to, but it's yeah. like a real safety net for me because I know that no matter what, if I if I think to myself, wait, did the, the did the conductor like this take or the other one? It, it undoubtedly it's in the recording. Mm, that, that's that's a really good tip as well. I've definitely been there where I've I've done a few takes and I was like, actually, what what was the reason that we were doing this take again? <laughs> right, so, and yeah. I do, and just just quickly, I I do also like in in the uh, the uh, session markers there are comments in, in Pro Tools that is you know uh, there is a comments field. On each track, there is a comments field. Uh, I'm trying to uh, get Avid to maybe make it so that those comments are 
attached to the session playlists instead of just the track because that would be fantastic if if they did that so that you know let's say you on a particular track you do a take three a take four like you could literally in the comments of of that particular take make your notes right there so and there's a way to do it also with the new feature of track markers but i haven't researched that enough to know whether that's a that's a viable solution but anyway sorry Awesome. No, thank you very much for that. So that's our questions on the running sessions, being a producer kind of thing. I know, Sarah, you had a particular one about networking. Do you feel like that's been answered or is there more to dig into there? Yeah, so I know you mentioned earlier about that at first you could attend events on your own and then yeah. as you lost your site, you would bring someone with you. And and you've answered that quite well, but I was just wondering though, like if you were sort of to attend a conference that did have, that was quite busy and there was a lot of people, how would you sort of figure out which people you would want to connect with and, and communicate that with whoever you're, you've brought to assist, like how, how would mm -hmm. You yeah, I, I mean, you know, if there's if there are specific people that I know will be attending and I want to to meet with them, I mean, at, at like I said, at this point for, for a number of years, I've always gone with a, a sighted assistant. Uh, often it's I mean, sometimes it's even my wife might might attend with me or, you know, a colleague of mine or I, like I said, I literally hire people to, to just, I'd say, Hey, look, if you want to attend the show, I'll fly you out there, you know, give you a place to stay in a hotel and you assist me, but you get to attend the show and see whatever you want to see as well. I mean, I would have arrangements like that with people sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I would, if there was a specific person that I wanted to see, I, you know, I would say to them, because they might not know, for example, you know, who, Frank Filippetti is or something like that. And I would, you know, and he'd be on a panel and I say, you know what, I got to go over to Frank because I got to ask him to introduce me to, you know, Leslie Jones, for example, another engineer, you know, because I, I want to contact with her. I want to be in contact with her over, uh, you know, Skywalker sound or something like that. I would basically <laughs> lean, o lean over to them and say, the guy who's talking now, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta approach him after this, you know. And then when the panel is 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 over, well, Frank knows me, so he'll he'll he recognizes me. But the point is getting to him. That's the problem. So you know, they get me to to him, and then you know, hey, Frank, could you introduce me to so and so? That that would be a likely scenario. The other thing that I found that when this happens at trade shows, when I would go with sighted people, I'd go to let's say to to a booth where. I didn't know the person and I would ask them a question, what they would inevitably do is they would start answering me and then turn to the sighted person and then really focus on them. And they're not they're not the the person who is seeking this information or trying to, you know, trying to communicate something. So we we came to you know to to agreement that they would bring me to that person and then they would walk away, you know, like my sighted colleague would introduce us oh yeah slough has a question for you blah 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 and then they would walk away to make sure that you know there was no sort of like this sort of misfocusing of their attention you know and then as we were done i'd you know turn around and walk away and then that person would say ah he's done and they'd come back over to me okay that's really like helpful to know because obviously i know when um, a lot of people don't like doing that because they don't want to be overshadowed or you know, mm -hmm. people to focus on the other person. I, I yes. think that seems to happen a lot in, in just different situations in general, really. Mm -hmm. So I guess like my final question around the whole networking thing is you might know who you'd want to talk to if they're on a panel and stuff, but what would you do if it's just because, the, you know, other people have attended the show. So making sure that you're able to sort of interact with just everyone else that's attended like you i'm not sure if i understand the question sorry so so obviously there's a lot of people in attendance so just attending with you know like communicating and networking with other attendees not necessarily 
anyone mm. that's on the panel. So you don't really know um, who else is there. So making those kind of connections with and building, just building a network with like, all everyone else around. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that at, at an event like a like a conference, like like the AES or something, you know, so, something along those lines where you might have a panel discussions or something like that. Occasionally, that there might be somebody that maybe has a question in the audience or somebody that I don't know. And again, if if I'm with, I I would be with a, a sighted guide, no question. I might say, you know what, that person says he's from Sony Masterworks. I, I'd like to try and you know to to reach out to him because I have a particular issue or some something you know whatever along those lines. I mean, it that always really relies on sighted assistance at, at a conference. I mean, I I don't. I don't attend conferences to to network with uh, people that I don't know. I often attend conferences to network with people that I do know. You know, so we would have a group of people, let's say that go to AES in in San Francisco or something that are all very sort of, sort of like, let's say microphone based. I I'll call it microphone based because I mean, I know so many people in the microphone sort of manufacturing world and so we would sometimes you know like spend uh, crazy amounts of time just going to parties and stuff like that it was just a certain group of people that i fell into being friends with and they would send me microphones to try out and get my opinion on certain things or i'd write reviews so they would send me you know uh, I would say copies of the microphone, not copies, you know, a sample, uh, you know, they would send me product to sort of to get it, to get my opinion on something and, and see what I thought. So it, it uh, yeah, it, it, I, I wouldn't necessarily go myself to, to seek out just simply meeting people like that. It's just not, didn't fall into my sort of world. I realize that sighted people, of course, might walk by and see somebody with a T-shirt that says something, and they oh, you know, and they strike up a conversation. It just it just doesn't happen for me. Okay, thank you. That's really interesting because I know you know these things are a lot of people like wonder, and and actually, it's quite refreshing to sort of hear like, well, I don't really go to these events to meet new people because mm -hmm. I think yeah. right. because there's so many people around when people turn up that it it's probably one of the first things that you know that comes into the head and really you don't really have to do it that way now until mm -hmm. you said that just then i actually didn't think of it like mm -hmm. that so that's yeah that's thank you that's really great to hear mm -hmm. i think as well once you once you kind of find your crowd a little bit and you you do meet some people who you do want to talk to they know people right and often they're, yes. they're more they're more than happy to introduce you to other people yes yes um, that who, certainly who, does happen yeah because you might go to a party or something like that and then so and so say oh have you met so and so and 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 you know and and that's just you don't expect that kind of stuff but that stuff does happen yeah but i i don't I, yeah I, i've just never i just know that that's a potential but but, but i i i, I never uh, sort of like sought that out yeah yeah. So another question that's related that has come up a few times being asked by by attendees: How do you find clients that you want to work with? How do you approach them in an accessible way? I well, you know, back the the place I mentioned in Brooklyn Systems Two, where I recorded like for, for the first time with a with a band. Um, I I always modeled. I I really looked up to the owners joe and nancy marciano uh, i thought they had a fantastic studio had a fantastic business recorded amazing artists um and i always kind of like wanted to like model myself after you know their kind of world and one thing that that i found early on was they never advertised <laughs> and i thought wow really you don't advertise and they said you know like we we put in an ad into the village voice like initially and then after that nothing they never had a website they just they just never got into promoting themselves that way meanwhile musicians and engineers knew them and knew their studio and and they were highly regarded in the industry they sold their their well they sold their building 
uh, a few years ago, and they finally retired and stuff like that. So they're no longer in Brooklyn. But I, I sort of took a cue from that, and I just I never looked for clients. I just never looked for clients, I, I, and and I I don't regret that because most of the time sort of my goal whenever i was recording somebody my goal was to have them be thrilled when they left with their recording you know at the end of the day or at the end of their project that was just my goal because i took pride in my work and i still do to this day and that's my ultimate goal and then you know if if you treat it that way chances are they're they're going to be returning the returning customers and chances are they will play it for someone who is either like-minded or a different you know, a colleague in a different band or a different artist, whatever. And, you know, if you're good at what you do, that, that business will come to you. So I've never looked for a client. Never. Interesting. Interesting. So just two quick questions to wrap us up. And I'm going to roll a few into one, which is going to be, if I'm in the position where I'm just starting out, are there any particular resources that I should be looking at that, that I would find helpful to get involved with mixing and mastering and producing? Anything that springs to mind as someone who's just starting out as a, as a blind or partially sighted engineer? Yeah, you know, I, 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 I can't think of anything. I mean, I, I thought about this a little bit because I saw that question, you know, really from, See, from I, the perspective. I, I think you might be doing yourself a bit of a disservice there. I, I was thinking you might plug the Pro Tools tutorials. Well, you know, that that's so specific, though. I mean, because, yeah, I mean, if if you're planning to use Pro Tools, yeah, there is a tutorial that's that Berkeley College, you know, funded, you know, through a grant. And yeah, I did produce a series of tutorials on how to use Pro Tools. It's like 20 hours of, of material. But that's so specific. Mm -hmm. That's just Pro Tools. I mean, you know, I, I'm thinking in sort of like larger terms, you know, and and you know, it, it, I suppose, you know, there's, there's no shortage of, of sources or, you know, learning techniques. I mean, you, you, you could practically Google something and, and, and get answers right away to almost anything you want to know. Um, so, so nothing comes to mind. I mean, you know, there are, like I said, those, those WhatsApp groups that I mentioned earlier. I mean, in general, things like Pro Tools Expert, for example, they do, excellent tutorials on stuff and given the fact that pretty much what you what they talk about even if you don't see it they they tell you what they're doing it's going to be pretty much the same for for a, a blind user once in a while you get these you know videos where they say well you click on this thing here and like oh gosh what <laughs> what are you talking about you know but you you kind of you could you could sort of deduce what what's what's being said but you know, in terms of somebody who's starting out, I, this is what I would say: if if that person is blind or visually impaired, to me, I've always said this. I would say that if you're blind or visually impaired, I would not plan on trying to work in a recording studio. You know, in a commercial recording studio. First of all you know the numbers they're they've been decimated over the years there are so few commercial studios left that the that the competition to try and get in there just to clean the toilets is is ridiculous you're going to face challenges as a visually impaired or blind person that the other people just will not face like Go get us, you know, Chinese food, you know, and it's a mile away. Or you're you're just not going to be able to compete with sighted people in that environment. To me, I always say, if you're thinking of getting into that that kind of business, you have to consider yourself a freelancer. You know, think of yourself. You know, consider yourself a business by all means. It is your business. But you have to be self-sufficient and you have to be able to deliver a product, become an expert maybe in a particular uh, either genre or style of music or type of recording. Like maybe you'll only work on vocal recordings or maybe you'll only, you know, 
you know, produce uh, drum recordings or something like that. Maybe you might have a piano or something like that. If it's a good piano, by all means, you could, you know, ha do demo recordings for people. But I always say, don't plan, don't, don't, don't have unrealistic goals. And to me, it's, it's, unrealistic to think that you're going to walk into blackbird studios or avatar and say i want a job i just i it's it's it's, it's not what i think is, is is a good idea having said that i think we're all in the business to try and change that and you know where mm. where there are suitable solutions is you know try and promote those as much as possible and and access those. I guess also at the same time, don't assume that you can't do something because it's it's quite likely that there will be people that have found alternate pathways. Yes, yes. The, the kind of the mainstream expectation to be an engineer that is the first person in the studio every day, the last person to leave, and at lunchtime you're grabbing lunch for everyone. That's that right. can be difficult, but yes. you that's not stopping you from working with artists in your local area building up really good relationships with with artists sure. and, and you know building up your kind of testimonials that way um mm -hmm. and you know finding finding your own trail to follow really sure sure and and let me just say you know that and that reminds me that one thing is that you know i i've been in situations where i've worked in in different studios in the capacity as the 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 chief engineer of that particular session even though i do not normally work in those particular studios let's say i don't need to know the console if i am if it is a commercial studio they have an assistant engineer that engineer comes with the studio and that assistant engineer has to be capable of running the full session by themselves okay so Anything that I need, all I have to do is say, could you patch, you know, the pull tech into this particular vocal channel? They take care of it. And, you know, I tell them what settings to use. They can set it up and they know how to set it up even without me telling them. But the point is, I run the session. I conduct it. I I drive Pro Tools during during those sessions. It just so happens that they I'll have the keyboard in front of me, the QWERTY keyboard that is, and and I'll just run Pro Tools, and and we're fine, and we get the stuff done, and then I take it back to to my studio here to do whatever editing, overdubs, mixing. These are sessions that are sort of more like cast albums where we might have nine or ten people. You know, and and nine or ten people in my in my live room, eh, it it's possible, but it's not ideal. You know, whereas these studios are you know three times the size of my live room, so it, it's much easier. So it is possible as a blind person to get to the point where you know what the process is, how to run a session, what the technical considerations are which microphones you you'd want to use if you had anything at you at your disposal and you can work quote unquote in a commercial studio environment and and be successful at it but you probably as a blind person wouldn't have an easy time at all trying to get onto their staff that's that's what i kind of mean to say Cool. No, really, really good to have that clarification. It's 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 really great to have you also saying that all of those things can be done, and the examples of the work that you do at, at your studio, mm -hmm. you know, all the, all those different roles really across the board: the producing, mm -hmm. the recording, the editing, presumably the some mastering as well. You know, getting involved with all those things is is great. So I'm just going to round off from our questions there. I can see we've got one hand raised, Sydney. Would you mind unmuting Marshall so we can ask his question, please? Yes. Hi, Slough. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, I mean, th throughout the whole day today, my, my audio has been just crazy. We couldn't figure out why everything's so quiet. I can hear you, but go ahead. Yes. Maybe I've maybe I've not got enough gain on the pre. No, no, I'm no. Much, it, it's I'm just across the board. Everybody, yeah. to me, in my headphones, no matter that my settings are like maxed out. I'm just, everything is kind of quiet, but I can hear you. Don't worry, go go on. 
All right, so just a 30-second background about myself. I'm Marshall Fairbrother. I work at the old library studios in Mansfield occasionally, and I'm based at home most of the time. Okay, the moment. now I'm losing you. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, speak closer to the mic if you can, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm right on top of this 58. In terms of running a session where, for example, you might have two microphones on a guitar cab and one is on axis, one is off axis, is that something that is in any way possible to set up as a blind person or is that something you would almost certainly have to all the time turn to your assistant to and that's from Marshall Fairbrother who works at the old library studios in Mansfield England with Inspire Youth Arts. Okay so first of all let me just say because some, some people might just find you know my, my answer just kind of a, a little bit unusual like I would never put two mics on a cab you know that to me i know i know that some people do but especially one on axis and one off axis to me i'm much more of a i will put the mic where i get the best sound and i'm going to keep it there and that's it i'm not one of these people that uh, really get into the, the the kind of science experiments where you're you know you you have a, an SM57 and an R121 and you know you're you're trying to blend them and get get the perfect sound. To me, I, I personally am not one of those people that gets into this kind of real experimentation. There is a place for that. Yes, there were times when I did try to experiment. I really got to the point where, uh, to me, you know, the 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 best mic is the closest one that's plugged in, and and I don't get into the minutia of like trying too many experiments. So so the idea of one mic on axis and one mic off, it, it, to me, it it, it almost it, it almost wouldn't matter. I I don't see any challenge as a blind person to setting those up. They will either be complementary in terms of phase relationship or they won't be and yeah. as an engineer you should be able to instantly hear a phase issue like you have to kind of learn how to be allergic to the to an out of phase microphone i just instantly yeah. hear it and so if it if it is out of phase adjust it on the fly you know if if you if you are you know set on recording both sources but the other thing is that these days you know gosh auto align post i mean you just you run you one of those mics through auto align post by again sound radics and you could fix a phase issue instantly like like in in no time at yeah. all with no effort so yeah i have that thing it's amazing yeah 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 cool so we do have one more hand up, which I think we've just about got time, if you're okay, Slav. Yeah, yeah. So we've, we've got a hand up from Jijesh. I, I hope I, I've pronounced your name there correctly. Yeah. Sydney, would you mind unmuting them, please? Yes. Hi, Flo. Hello. Hear me? Barely yes. hear you. Hi, Barely. So where we can get some free material for additional source for Logic Pro, that sort of thing. Pro Tools, you have that Berkeley tutorial there. And I was also told some Dropbox tutorial is also available. So where we can get everything. So Jijesh is asking for the best way to find those resources. And I think I'm going to kind of relay this to, to Sound Without Sight, not as a plug, but just as that is the, that's the genuine ambition behind Sound Without Sight to be the place that connects these things together. So if there is a specific piece of software that you would like support for, you would like to find resources or a community of people, you should be able to search in the search bar on Sound Without Sight for that piece of software and find resources right. that, 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 that should, should help you on your way. Right. And just specifically on your Pro Tools tutorials that, that you helped to create, Slough, I think the, the quickest way to access them would be at ptaccess.github.io. Have I got that correct? Yes, that is the official, yes. Awesome. Just before we end, I just wanted to ask one more really quick yeah, yeah, one. Yeah, sure. Where can people find your kind of social media, your work and stuff, and, you know, kind of follow and all your kind of connection, social connection. Yeah. Kind of you know, I used to be on Twitter, 
<laughs> but that is no more as far as I'm concerned. So so I don't I, I I'm I'm not on there anymore. I do still I believe I still do have the sessions with Slough website, but that was really for the podcast, which I have not kept up. I mean, you know, I, I am of course on on the the Pro Tools WhatsApp group and and the the email list and stuff if people, you know, need to reach out to me. And you know, my my email is slough at B Sharp Studios and that's B E S H A R P S T U D I O S dot com. That's the best way to 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 reach me. I'll quickly paste that in the chat for anyone who wants it. Mm -hmm. Well Thank you very, very much for your time. That was really, really insightful. Yeah, and I, I, we got most of the questions answered, which which is great. Thank you for staying a little bit longer than we planned. Yeah, really, really appreciate that. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Sound Without Sight podcast. Sound Without Sight is a community-driven online knowledge hub collating information and resources to support blind and partially sighted musicians and audio engineers to break down access barriers. If you're a visually impaired musician or audio engineer, why not share some solutions you've found on our Knowledge Hub? You can learn more and get involved at soundwithoutsight.org. If you've enjoyed listening to this podcast, please consider making a donation to support the project. You can do so at soundwithoutsight.org forward slash donate. The music you're listening to was kindly contributed by community member Mackie Jones of maplemixproductions.com.